They passed away from severe, yet fairly common illnesses. Vladimir Lenin succumbed to atherosclerosis and Stalin to a cerebral hemorrhage. Kostyantin Chernenko's health was compromised by asthma. These were the official diagnoses. These were the official accounts of the Kremlin leader's deaths. Only a select few insiders knew that the death of the Soviet leaders was the result of the use of an ideal murder weapon created in the USSR, namely, lethal poisons. These toxins were produced here in Moscow, and they were created by the top experts of the NKVD's secret laboratory. Their task was to develop a potent method for neutralizing the adversaries of the Soviet Union. However, the ideologists and founders of the secret laboratory had no idea that this weapon would soon turn against them too. For the first time, the actual causes of death of Soviet leaders. Lenin developed a fondness for mushroom soup. Today it is suggested that the toxicity of the Cortinarius cyosissimus mushroom is in question. This is a poisonous mushroom that could potentially lead to fatal consequences. And Gorky died from his love of sweets. A new position at the Kremlin, a food taster for Stalin. Why didn't the leader eat the food at his own banquets? It was not merely a case of poisoning. It was a horrific contamination of all bodily systems. The hemorrhage was so intense that upon opening the stomach, it appeared as though it had been riddled with bullets. The perfect weapon from the NKVD's secret laboratory. The deaths of CEOs due to heart attacks are actually the outcomes of extremely potent poisons. Nineteen twenty-four, all of Moscow bids farewell to Lenin. Despite the freezing cold, people endure long hours in line to approach the red coffin containing the body of the leader. The official cause of Lenin's death will be declared as atherosclerosis of blood vessels due to their premature aging. But immediately after the funeral, rumors will begin to circulate throughout the capital, suggesting that the beloved leader's death was not as straightforward as it seems. The most daring will even speculate. Lenin was poisoned. Lenin's personal physician, Fyodor Getier, was the first to harbor suspicions. He even refused to sign the report on the leader's death. He referred to the inaccuracies of the autopsy. The autopsy of Lenin's body commenced with a considerable delay, 16 hours and 20 minutes after his death was declared. For some reason, pathologists did not perform a chemical analysis of the deceased's stomach contents, even though the stomach walls were completely destroyed. They were destroyed by an unidentified substance, probably a potent poison. But why poison a frail old man who didn't have much time left anyway? Who was bothered by the dying Lenin? He could barely move and talk, but he was alive. And Stalin realized that regardless of how severe Lenin's illness was, as long as Lenin was alive, he was the nominal leader. He, not Stalin. Watch without commercial interruptions. What poison was used to assassinate Vladimir Lenin, and how did his favorite mushroom soup contribute to the leader's demise? A poisoned cake for psychiatrist Bekhterev. Stalin's retaliation for the diagnosis of paranoia. By Stalin's decree, a mausoleum will be specifically constructed for the interment of the first Soviet leader. Fifty-six days after Ilyich's death, the Bolsheviks decided to embalm his body. Then additional evidence of Lenin's poisoning will emerge. During the embalming process, lethal toxins, amanitin and phalloidin, were discovered in the roots of the deceased leader's hair. 
Researchers claim that these toxins are found in poisonous mushrooms. It was well known in the Kremlin that Lenin was a passionate mushroom forager and often requested mushroom soup for dinner, which he prepared and dried with his own hands. But a couple of weeks before his death, he was served a soup that contained completely different mushrooms. Here it is, the deadly mushroom Cortinarius chiosimus. His poison doesn't kill instantly, but gradually over a span of two weeks. Once introduced into the human body, this toxin paralyzes the body's motor functions and induces respiratory distress. Such symptoms were observed in Lenin during the last days of his life. The inner circle of the leader never discovered that the lethal mushroom came from a secret poison laboratory established by Lenin himself. But why was there a need for such a laboratory? The truth is that every country has such laboratories. This can be justified by the fact that national security is tied to this field. Lenin believed that the Soviet government had numerous adversaries who could be eliminated without drawing attention. That is, to make their deaths appear natural, diagnosable as, for example, a heart attack or well, as some kind of chronic illness. Soviet chemists and microbiologists experimented with a wide range of substances, from traditional plant toxins to the most recent chemical compounds. The results of these experiments will soon become evident when a series of strange and mysterious deaths occur in the USSR. In 1936, a gift from the Kremlin, a box of chocolates, was delivered to the town of Gorky near Moscow, where the writer Maxim Gorky resided and received treatment. The author sampled the Kremlin's hospitality. The following day, he passed away. On June 19, 1936, the Pravda newspaper reported unfortunate news. The Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks and the Council of People's Commissars of the USSR announced with profound sorrow the passing of a true friend of the working class and a champion for the triumph of communism, Comrade Oleksiy Maximovich Gorky. Among the many eulogies, not a single word was mentioned about the cause of his death. Gorky's body will be cremated and interred in the Kremlin wall. Comrade Stalin will personally carry the urn with the ashes. There's no doubt that the eminent proletarian writer's death marked his end. But why kill the storm petrol of the revolution? The reality is that during those years, a significant conflict was anticipated between Gorky and Stalin. He could not reconcile with the repressions that were imposed, including on his closest friends. It is known that Lev Borisovich Kamenev was Gorky's deputy at the Academy Publishing House. Kamenev was among the first to suffer. He was executed in the 34th year. And Gorky began corresponding with Louis Aragon, Romain Roland, André Gide that is, with prominent and well-respected communist writers who held high esteem in the West. He invited them to the Soviet Union to share their impressions. What could Stalin have done in this situation? It's impossible to arrest and execute a world-renowned author. However, it can be discreetly eliminated without shedding a single drop of blood using a potent poison. Stalin carried out his plans through his assistant, the head of the NKVD and his loyal executioner, Genrik Yagoda. He was the one who brought Gorky candies laced with deadly poison. The omnipotent chief of Stalin's secret police, Heinrich Yagoda, had known the writer since childhood. 
the future voice of the revolution, and the chief Soviet secret police officer were neighbors in Nizhny Novgorod. Then Gorky called young Henry Berry. They met many years later in Moscow. Gorky had already become a globally renowned writer, and Yagidka had become the foremost executioner of the Great Terror Era. Under his direct leadership, the Gulag was established. Moreover, he became the inaugural overseer of the poison laboratory. On Stalin's orders, he will eliminate his compatriot and former neighbor, Maxim Gorky. However, the demise of the author will also be a judgment for him. Stalin, having planned to assassinate Gorky, intended to deliver a double blow, to the victim and to his poisoner. 1938. Two months after Gorky's death, the show trial of Heinrich Yagoda began in the October Hall of the House of Unions. The main accusations, the assassination of Gorky, the murder of Politburo member of the Central Committee Kirov, and espionage. Yagoda will be sentenced to death. Stalin appointed Mikola Yezhov to the vacant position of the chief Soviet executioner. He will surpass his predecessor in many aspects. Nearly 800,000 people will be affected by his orders. Yezhov won't even spare his own wife. He will kill her with lewisite, a poison from a secret laboratory. According to one theory, it was due to constant betrayals while another suggests it was because the woman interfered with his homosexual relationship. Due to his exceptional cruelty and short stature, Yezov was referred to as the Bloody Dwarf. He held his position for only two years, until his place was taken by a powerful competitor, a man named Lavrenti Beria. Watch without commercial interruptions. The brutal special operation of Nikolai Yezhov's successor. Why did Stalin appoint Beria as the head of the NKVD? Mysterious disappearances of hundreds of Moscow residents. Examining the effects of toxins on humans under controlled conditions. Academician Volodymyr Bekhterev rushed to the Kremlin. Comrade Stalin himself required the consultation of a renowned psychiatrist. The scientists spent more than an hour alone with the leader. Due to this visit, he was significantly late for the All-Union Congress of Psychiatrists and Neurologists. And when he finally arrived, he nervously answered his colleagues' questions. I was at the Kremlin. To observe a paranoid person with a withered hand. The only person in the Kremlin who had such power was Stalin. In photographs and newsreel footage, one of Stalin's arms is always slightly bent. More often than not, the Secretary General carries a briefcase in his hand, and sometimes hides it behind the hem of his coat or behind his back. In this way, Stalin conceals his left hand, which was crippled in his childhood. When Stalin was ten years old, he was hit by a phaeton. Due to the injury, the left arm started to become infected, later atrophied, and eventually became four centimeters shorter than the right. It is unclear what impacted the leader more in Bekhterev's words, the reference to his crippled hand or the assertion of mental deviation. However, when these words were relayed to the leader, the academician's fate was sealed. That evening, the Mali Theater was staging the play Lyubov Yarova. Bekhterev also came to watch the performance. During the break, the academic went to the cafeteria. There he spoke to a curious young man with a Georgian accent. He drank juice and ate a cake. When he arrived home, he felt unwell and passed away a few hours later. According to the official account, he was poisoned by canned food. It remains unclear why it was canned food, 
After all, representatives from the health department did not perform a pathological examination and did not investigate the stomach contents. They only extracted the scientist's brain for experiments. The body was hastily cremated, allegedly per Bekhterev's own wishes, although his relatives insisted on a burial. After a successful operation to treat Bekhterev's disease, Beria will be promoted. Stalin will appoint him as the director of a secret laboratory. Under Beria's leadership, this covert unit will transform into a potent poison factory. The chief assistant to the head of the NKVD will be the talented chemist and physician, Prihori Marinovsky. Grigory Marinovsky was later referred to as the Soviet Dr. Death. Beria will assign him the task of creating a perfect poison that leaves no traces during an autopsy. And for this, he will provide Dr. Marinovsky with a unique opportunity to conduct experiments on human subjects. In a particular letter, later penned by the Prosecutor General of the USSR, Rudenko, and the head of the KGB, Semihasny, it was stated that these individuals were either unjustly sentenced to death or were people who had been abducted off the streets. Such a phrase exists. This is a very significant and important document in the history of Marinovsky, but ultimately also in the history of the system that was created under Beria and his associates. Muscovites avoided this alley in the city center in the 1930s. Until 1917, the Varsinofievsky Monastery was situated here, later becoming the headquarters and torture chambers of the NKVD. This was where the clandestine lab for producing poison was situated. Their covert experiments were conducted using makeshift resources, namely local prisoners. The man gasped for air, started to choke, his lips turned blue, his body convulsed, and then went limp. His eyes rolled. Throughout this period, the subject is closely observed by the medical committee led by Myronovsky. The assistant meticulously documents the process of death. This is one of Myronovsky's initial experiments. An experiment involving mustard gas was conducted. Subsequently, he began to investigate the effects of arsenic, potassium cyanide, and mercury. Then, the study moved on to thallium, hydrocyanic acid, and curare. Marinovsky mixed, combined, and altered the dosage of poisons. He administered them through injections, applied them on the skin, and incorporated them into the food of his subjects. He tested each option on 10 test subjects, and in the end, he managed to achieve the desired result. A person poisoned died instantly and peacefully. However, the most crucial aspect remained, that is, to attain a result in which no doctor could ascertain the true cause of death. This is the Sklifosovsky Institute in Moscow. This is where a secret cargo was delivered twice a week from Varsinofievsky Lane. The car arrived late at night. The paramedics left the institute and transported the bodies for examination by pathologists. But each time they received a disappointing response. During the autopsy, poison was detected in the bodies of the deceased. It will be several months before the doctors finally make another diagnosis. The cause of death is acute heart failure. It was a huge success. After extensive experiments, doctors were able to develop a poison that was perfectly suited for the operations of Czechist agents. This toxin was labeled as K2. This is a chemical compound called choline chloride. The toxic solution or powder could be added to food. The result exceeded all expectations. Fifteen minutes later, the man died of cardiac arrest. 
Beria rushed to inform Stalin about the accomplishments of the laboratory scientists. In nearly 100% of cases, pathologists declared heart attack, heart attack, heart attack. When this experiment was conducted on numerous individuals, it became evident that the toxin could be utilized in tactical operations. Consequently, they began to implement such operations on others. What occurred following the discovery of this poison could be viewed as a coincidence or a fatal accident. However, the fact remains. All the representatives of Lenin's old guard, whom Stalin despised and feared so much, turned out to be cardiac patients. Of course, it became evident after the sudden demise of each one of them. In 1933, while on the way to Spain, Commissar Lunacharsky suffered from heart failure. In 1935, Slutsky, the chief of foreign intelligence for the NKVD, passed away in Lubyanka after consuming tea and biscuits. The diagnosis was an acute heart attack. In 1937, Orjonikidze died of a heart attack. And finally, in 1938, Kuybyshev, a member of the Central Committee, died from heart sclerosis. And this is despite the fact that they were all quite young for such age-related diagnoses. Lunacharsky was 58 years old, Orjonikidze was 51, Kuybyshev was 45, and Abram Slutsky was only 40. The laboratory continues to operate, assisting the leader in methodically eliminating the undeserving. However, the greater the success of this laboratory, the more it terrifies Stalin. Gradually, an almost primal fear takes hold in the soul of the general secretary. Fear of being poisoned. Contrary to the common belief that the leader had simple tastes, Stalin still enjoyed eating well. He preferred fish dishes, primarily Danube herring and smoked shamaya. He selected tomatoes and eggplants as vegetables, but he seldom consumed meat. Stalin did not like canned food at all. He was very fond of jam made from unripe nuts, which his mother used to send him. Every dish served to the secretary general was accompanied by a report from a special committee. No toxic substances were detected. The Secretary General has established an incredibly rigorous product control system. He received water from Abkhazia, and wine was shipped directly from Georgia via a special route. Even such improved security measures often failed to satisfy Stalin. His bodyguard stated that once a batch of wine was delivered to him from Georgia, and he commanded it to be disposed of. They say that when he was given a prescription, that is, when a doctor prescribed him medication, like aspirin or something else, he would hand the prescription to the guard and say, go, there's a village pharmacy nearby, buy it there. And Stalin simply discarded the medicine prescribed by the doctor. This was the case in all situations. Even at the renowned Stalinist banquets, when the guests sat down for dinner, the general secretary was always the last one to begin eating. Using various excuses, he compelled his fellow party members to try every dish without exception. He waited for a while before he started eating. Who was Stalin so afraid of? It was his aide and faithful associate, Lavrenti Beria. The more powerful and influential the NKVD chief became, the greater the threat he posed to the general secretary. Eventually, Stalin decides to eliminate Beria, after which he initiates one of the final purges, the Mingrelian affair. The objective was to eliminate those who were close to Beria. There was even a rhyme circulating around Moscow at that time. Our comrade Beria is no longer trusted. Soon, the general secretary will strike another blow against Beria. He will arrest the chief Soviet poisoner, Krehori Marinovsky. 
The director of the toxicology laboratory is accused of unlawful storage of hazardous substances. The Soviet doctor of death was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Marinovsky decided to defend himself and began writing letters to the authorities, asserting his innocence. After all, he carried out all these experiments under the personal directives of Comrade Beria, and naturally, who would have thought that he could do it himself? Indeed, he did nothing. What about Beria? He didn't assist his former protege. The influential commissar took care of his own life. Lavrenti Beria knew his leader all too well and understood that Stalin would not forgive him, so he prepared for conflict. Beria understood that to save himself, he needed to make the first move. And he did it. Stay tuned for the program. Sensational details about Joseph Stalin's death. The general secretary was assassinated using poison from the NKVD's secret laboratory, and it was dispatched on the orders of Lavrenti Beria, weak leaders in power. Konstantin Chernenko was allegedly poisoned a few days before his pivotal appointment. On March 5, 1953, Stalin was found lying on the floor of his dacha in Kuntsevo. Helpless, exhausted, he could not even call for help. Meanwhile, several people were patiently waiting outside the door for his demise. These were the closest associates of the Secretary General. Lavrenti Beria was among them. Finally, a woman entered the room. She gave him an injection. A few hours later, Stalin passed away. The official cause of his death was a cerebral hemorrhage. Indeed, according to experts, it was a typical case of poisoning. Stalin's worst fears were confirmed. He was assassinated by poison from a covert laboratory, a poison administered under the command of Lavrenti Beria. Beria himself will soon repeat the fate of Stalin. He will be executed under the orders of Nikita Khrushchev. However, they will employ a more conventional method. They will execute him in the Lubyanka torture chambers. But the saga of the Kremlin's poisonings will not end there. The poison lab will continue its operations under new ownership. Continue watching without commercial interruptions. Ukrainian nationalist Stepan Bandera and Bulgarian dissident Georgi Markov are the upcoming subjects of the poison laboratory. Soviet method of assassination in the renowned French comedy Le Coup du Parapluie, The Umbrella Coup. In October 1959, a young man walked into the entrance of a house at Kreitmeierstrasse 7 in Munich. In his hand, he holds a rolled up newspaper. In a few minutes, an elderly man will enter the house carrying a bag of tomatoes. As soon as he closes the door behind him, a barely audible sound will be heard. A stream of toxic liquid splashed onto the man's face. He fell and never got up. This is how Stepan Bandera, the leader of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, was assassinated. The sentence was executed by the professional Soviet assassin, Bodan Stashinsky. This miniature pistol is no bigger than a fountain pen. It is filled with vials of poison. Today, any bottle of eau de toilette functions in this way, but back then it was a technological novelty. You press the button and a toxic aerosol disperses. The gun used by Stepan Bandera's assassin was loaded with potassium cyanide. This poison has neither color nor odor. The poison takes effect immediately and rapidly dissipates from the body. At that time, the Soviet poison laboratory already had substances for any situation. Some poisons cause quick and painless death, while others result in a lengthy and unbearable demise. Some toxins enter the body through food, others through the air, clothing, 
or simply by touching an object. These were not only toxins, by the way, but also substances that can incapacitate a person for a while. For instance, substances that can allow people to work for extended periods despite exhaustion. In other words, these are also drugs that induce talkativeness, commonly known as truth serums. The concept was to create a drug that would eliminate the need to torture a prisoner. Instead, you would simply give him this pill. He would take it and instantly reveal everything, immediately disclose all information. So it was such an attractive idea. In 1981, the French comedy The Umbrella Coup, starring Pierre Richard, was released on Soviet screens. The movie about a tall, clumsy blonde became the box office hit in the Soviet Union. However, few people knew at the time that the comedy was based on the true story of a murder. In 1978, dissident and BBC employee Gorgi Markov was poisoned in London. Walking through a crowd of people, he tripped over someone's umbrella and passed away three days later. KGB agents used a poison-tipped umbrella for the assassination. A poisoned umbrella is the most sophisticated method of public assassination. A shooting mechanism is integrated into the tip of the umbrella. The device ejects poisonous ampules. The remnants of such a capsule were discovered in the leg of the deceased Markov. The umbrella released ricin. It is an extremely potent poison, 80 times stronger than potassium cyanide, and it is also inexpensive. The product is derived from the waste cake of castor oil production. The victim is destined for a slow and painful death. Initially, the individual's eyes become red, blisters appear on the skin, the body temperature increases, and convulsions start. Riken has no antidote. Doctors can only alleviate the symptoms of the afflicted. There were, presumably, many other poisonings for which there is no proof. The documents might not even exist, given that many documents are highly sensitive. The highest level of confidentiality that existed in the Soviet Union was the so-called special file. It was a singular copy, and virtually no one had access to this folder, except for the executors and members of the Politburo. Who ordered these mysterious killings? At that time, the KGB was led by Andropov. He coordinated operations with Leonid Brezhnev. However, in reality, the frail, exhausted general secretary dreamt of only one thing, to resign, but it did not come to fruition. On July 17, 1978, the youngest member of Brezhnev's Politburo, Fyodor Kulikov, passed away at his dacha in the Moscow region. The following day, Itar Tass reported that the cause of death was acute heart failure due to sudden cardiac arrest. Kulikov's death will become one of the most enigmatic events of the Brezhnev era. He was only 60. Moreover, Kulikov never complained about his heart. Immediately following his demise, peculiar rumors started circulating within the party. Incredibly, just before this event, Leonid Brezhnev, who was barely kept alive by doctors after a near-death experience, was preparing to resign and had even named his potential successor, Fyodor Kulikov. Ultimately, Brezhnev was not permitted to resign. His inner circle convinced him to remain in office. And shortly after that, his protege, Fedir Kulikov, suddenly died. But why? Here's what Kaznachev, the former secretary of the Stavropol Regional Committee of the party, has written on the matter. That evening, for reasons unknown, his bodyguards and personal physician, who were assigned to each member of the Politburo, left Kulikov's dacha. And by morning, his wife found him dead. By a strange coincidence, young Kulikov also happened to have a heart disease. 
Kolakov's position as the secretary of the Central Committee will be succeeded by his compatriot, Mikhail Gorbachev. This will be the first step towards the Kremlin Olympus for the secretary of the Provincial City Committee. But who was the benevolent angel who helped him ascend to the pinnacle of power? The omnipotent KGB chief, Yuri Andropov. He led the world's most powerful intelligence service for 15 years, but for seven of those years, he was entirely in control of the country, single-handedly making decisions that the ailing secretary general was no longer capable of. For instance, he was the one who convinced Brezhnev to sign the order to deploy troops to Afghanistan. And he was the one who would become the sole leader of the USSR after the death of Leonid Ilyich. However, Andropov will only govern the country for 15 months. The history of the illness of the omnipotent head of the KGB was one of the greatest secrets of the Soviet Union. Andropov suffered from chronic kidney failure. The situation was exacerbated by the Asian flu contracted in Afghanistan. He was kept alive with the help of potent medications. Andropov governed the country from a hospital bed. He knew he wouldn't last long and was preparing his successor. However, it was Mikhail Gorbachev, not Konstantin Chernenko, who took over the country after Andropov's death. But then why isn't he, but rather Chernenko, who will become the next secretary general? Konstantin Chernenko was a protege of Brezhnev. He was widely recognized and backed within the Central Committee. But Gorbachev was a new kind of leader. Andropov's protege worked as the secretary of the Stavropol Regional Committee of the CPSU until 1978, and he was elected a member of the Politburo in Moscow just four years prior to the death of the former KGB head. Thus, Gorbachev simply could not rival Chernenko in terms of influence and significance within the party. But as it turned out, there was no need for this. At Andropov's funeral, it will become clear to the entire country that the next secretary general will also not have a long tenure. Konstantin Chernenko can barely read a short eulogy. He will slouch, mumble his words, blow his nose. Only his inner circle will understand why the formerly robust old man has become a wreck. This is what 73-year-old Chernenko looked like just six months ago. He vacationed with his family in Crimea. He felt great and swam effortlessly beyond the buoys. Once, Vitaly Fedorchuk, the Minister of Internal Affairs of the USSR, paid him a visit. He stayed nearby in a government sanatorium. Fedorchuk suggested trying smoked fish. Chernenko savored the delicacy with pleasure. And at night, he was awakened by unbearable stomach pain. He was urgently transferred to Moscow in a very critical condition. Doctors reported that the cause of severe poisoning was spoiled fish. However, the entire family ate the fish, but only Chernenko got poisoned. And here is the result. Severe toxic infection with complications manifesting as heart and lung failure. Doctors literally pulled the future general secretary back from the brink of death. But they could not restore his health. Chernenko was already incapacitated. But why did the dish brought by Fedorchuk pass the traditional inspection? What toxic substances could have been present in the smoked fish that Chernenko tasted. The truth is that from a young age, Kostyantin Ustinovich suffered from a severe condition, bronchial asthma. He had an allergic variant of the disease, primarily impacting the respiratory system. In the context of chronic bronchial asthma, individuals suffering from it can develop an even more severe lung-related condition, specifically pulmonary emphysema. You know, any infection, even a minor one, like a foodborne illness or a respiratory infection, could be lethal for such a severely ill person. And then, 
Kostyantin Ustinovich was indeed fortunate to have survived the poisoning at all. Many years later, in his book Health and Power, Yevhen Chasov, the Kremlin's chief physician, would write about how he reported to Secretary General Andropov after examining Chernenko. Andropov was just about to go on holiday. In his absence, Chernenko always stayed on duty in the country. After calmly listening to the news of the horrific poisoning, Andropov said, I can't do anything to help him. And Gorbachev will stay in the Central Committee, who is knowledgeable about all issues and will handle the work calmly. Andropov will pass away two months later. His position will be assumed by the still living but frail Chernenko. He will govern the country for only 13 months. After the death of the General Secretary, Mikhail Gorbachev came to power. It will conclude the era of the Soviet Union with its secrets and poisonings. Some information from the archives stored in Lubyanka will be made public. However, these documents will not reveal anything about the fate of the secret laboratory, which for over 60 years catered to the political and personal needs of the USSR leaders. Yes, of course, this laboratory existed. It's clear that it still exists, but for obvious reasons, nothing is known about it. We don't even know who took over after Maranovsky. That is, the laboratory was previously dissolved, but it may have simply been renamed and relocated to a different structure. Documents on this subject are currently stored in the confidential archives of the FSB, and they contain classified information about toxins produced in Soviet specialized laboratories, the perfect weapon of the Kremlin leaders who became its most notorious victims.